Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm an engineer and my passion is design, development and prototype production of all sorts of engineering solutions. In this episode I would like to show you how I use this improvised setup here to test the accuracy of this very fine 1966 made Avimo clinometer or uh, a gunner's quadrant because it's the, the basic intention of this tool is to test the sights of artillery guns but all in all it's a very fine adjustable level with arc minute accuracy which makes it very useful for general workshop purposes. I bought this clinometer a few months ago and had to recondition it because once in its lifetime it fell onto this corner here which caused the frame to deform slightly and caused the testing surfaces to be slightly out of square, uh, about 50 microns or so. So I rescraped the testing surfaces to make it serviceable again, but still I was always very curious about how precise the two adjusting mechanisms in this clinometer are. So that's why I came up with this setup here. But this video is not only about testing this level, it also includes some video footage on making this receiver plate here because this is a machined and scraped plate to provide a setup surface for the clinometer and also to hold the arc second accurate Wildherbog T2 theater light which you've probably seen in one of my former videos. So this T2 theater light is arc second accurate and therefore it's one to two orders of magnitude more precise than this level which makes it kind of a proper standard or at least a good standard for for this testing setup here. So enough talk, let's take a look. Now let's take a look at this clinometer first. With this type of clinometer we have two methods of adjustability which I'm going to talk about in a, in a second. Basically we have these two sets of testing surfaces. These ones here to measure from horizontal to 45 degrees and these ones to measure from 45 degrees to 90 degrees. And the mechanisms for adjustment are firstly these teeth here we, into which the spring-loaded latch engages and allows us to adjust in uh, one degree increments and then we have this slider here which slides along this ever so slightly curved bar and the graduation goes from zero, de uh, zero minutes to 60 minutes so this covers the uh, the space in between the one degree increments that we set with the spring-loaded latch here. The very elegant thing about these two adjustments or these two mechanisms for adjustment in comparison to the screw type actuated um, clinometers is that this is set very quickly and you can find your target angle to be measured in a very quick kind of way. One very elegant design feature about this spring-loaded latch here is that there are several teeth hidden underneath here that engage with these teeth here. So the uh, consequence of this is that we're averaging manufacturing errors in spacing of these teeth here to a certain degree of course. The spirit level itself is on top of the slider here and the graduations you see, they are roughly three quarters of an arc minute per graduation. I don't know what's the reason for this, but who cares? In practice, we are centering the bubble in here anyways by moving the slider and reading our arc minutes here. This screw here is to set the zero point of the level and the procedure to do this is the same as with any non-adjustable level. So let's set this to zero. If this was our surface plate or precision scraped surface or any other precision surface then we set our level in one place. Keep in mind the reading. 
invert it, set it to the same place, and the reading should be the same. And we adjust the screw until the reading is the same in both orientations. Now, of course, this is much simpler if the surface is perfectly level, because then we set it to be in the center, and it should be in the center in both orientations. Now that's all nice and neat to set the zero point, however the key question here in this video is how precise are these two scales that set any angle in between the horizontal and the vertical position. And the most straightforward way to check this would be to use a sign bar and stacks of gauge blocks to set certain angles and check the angle of the sign bar with the level and the level of course should display this certain angle. However, I wanted to avoid using this method because I wanted to check every incremental position here, which would involve 45 different stacks of gauge blocks with lots of potential error in setting them. And then we would have only checked these graduations here, not to speak of this one. Now, you may say, what's the point in fiddling around with a mechanical instrument like this one, where you have to move the slider and set the spring-loaded latch to find your angle, uh, while using a more modern, digital and cheap level is much more convenient? Well, of the cheap digital levels that I've checked so far, uh, the point is, they're fairly precise in the horizontal and in the vertical position, However, they're, they're really lacking precision in any position in between. So the, the precision they have for the angles in between horizontal and vertical are roughly 0.1 or 0.2 of a degree, which is 6 to 12 arc minutes. So it's this far. So the point here is to see if this level here is more precise than the cheap digital ones. And let's see about that. This is how the weather is currently treating us. Sorry for the shaky video, guys. My excuse is that I wasn't wearing pants. That's 330 kilograms per square meters on the roofs, which will clear today as we're expecting even more snow. Anyway, back to machining again. For the receiver plate, we start with a piece of continuously cast gray iron, since this is really nice to scrape. Indicating this first setup with the independent forger chuck is kinda unnecessary, since the blank is not so much cylindrical anyway. However, you know how machinists are. That's digging through the hardest crust. Roughing out the shoulder on which the receiver plate will be grabbed by the dividing head. Then drilling, counterboring and chamfering. Reversing the part and indicating. This time indicating is necessary to make sure the shoulder runs true with the centering pocket on this side. This is indicating the back face just to be sure that I can sleep easily. Boring out the tight tolerance diameter centering pocket. And telescopic gauging it. Here I'm relieving the face of its unfunctional area. And chamfering again. Next we are on the micron mill again to rough down the setup surface.
machine in cast iron is dirty, but who cares, it's awesome. So here's the rough machine part. I've added two threaded holes off camera. This one's function I'll explain later on. And this one here holds a shoulder bolt which keeps the level from sliding off of the setup surface. Simple as that. And then of course we have the centering adapter to hold the theodolite. All right, ready for the first spotting cycle. Ah, sounds bad. Of course, there's a little chip caught on the surface. That's better. Not the surface though, but scraping will take care of that. The deviations from flatness you see from the spotting pattern are a result of the cast iron's inhomogeneous material strength. The deviations amount to a few microns and are only a bit more than the surface roughness. Here is this face after a few scraping cycles. Let's see how it spots. I'm not much worried about thermally induced part distortion from me touching it, because this part is very compact and thick. Also, we're not aiming for single micron precision here. Yeah, that's a good pattern. However, you see that my spotting compound layer was too thick. Speaking of layer thickness, this tiny speck of spotting compound here is way enough for five or six roughing cycles. And this here is my right angle reference block to make sure our scraped setup surface is square with the theodolite base. Note that I'm touching the block only above the guiding area to keep thermally induced distortion negligible. And such a spotting pattern is pretty typical for a machined surface. The ridge is from stepping over the face mill. This ridge is probably 20 or so microns tall and we'll remove it first. These are pretty heavy roughing strokes, which you can derive from the chip volume. The burring is particularly important during the roughing cycle. This is close to the end of roughing. Here there are still some milling marks which must be taken off. Note that I'm not following the spotting pattern very much, I'm rather roughing down most of the surface. The spotting pattern is used here during roughing just as a guideline to see where the large low spots are.
Naturally, the carbide insert must be sharpened frequently to achieve good scraping results. Here I'm setting up the D-bit grinder for scraper insert freehand sharpening. Swapping the dividing head for the freehand platform. And swapping the aluminum oxide wheel for a 600 grit resin bound diamond cup wheel. I recommend using an even finer grit for this. However, this wheel is what I have around and it works well. Setting some negative 5-ish degrees. Note that I'm grinding into the cutting edge, which is important with the brittle tungsten carbide. The grinding pressure I use is almost unfeelable. I'm ever so gently touching the insert to the wheel. That's all it needs. So here are one of the final finishing cycles on the setup surface. We're aiming for a slightly denser spotting pattern towards the left and right ends to make sure we are flat and not just unintentionally rocking the part over the spotting plate. In contrast to before, you see that now I'm following the spotting pattern quite closely to improve contact pattern, flatness and surface roughness. This is only taking off two or so microns with each stroke. You can get an idea of this from the chip volume. It's interesting, with a dead sharp insert you can even feel the few microns tall elevations and find yourself comparing this feeling with the spotting pattern. and leaving the ends alone to get a denser spotting pattern here. If you look closely you can see several stone polished high spots. It's important that there are immediately several spots. This proves along with the precision ground flat stones that the surface is pretty flat. And off to the final spotting cycle. That's how we want it, a bit denser towards the ends. And to give you an impression of the reflective qualities of the finished scraped surfaces. Time to get the Wild Herbrug T2 out of its probably car crash safe casing and let it see some daylight again. First we need the base, or also called Triebrach.
The function of this Allen head screw is to act as a rotation stop and indicator. What I do is, I insert this 20 micron thick shim stock between the screw heads and the Triebrach foot. If it would turn away from the screw head during the test, this can be easily recognized from loose or lost shim stock. Using a second screw doesn't make sense here, since the Triebrach feet are painted and have no precise width. Clamping this arrangement with the trusty Walter UTA dividing head. Next we must make sure that the three contact points in the Triebrach are square with the dividing head's axis of rotation. Yeah, this one is a bit off. and mounting the T2. If it could talk, it would probably complain about its unintended use with its vertical axis horizontal. Or maybe not, who knows. We're only gonna be using the horizontal circle for this test, same as in my dividing head testing video. And the setup is ready to receive the clinometer. So, we are ready for testing. It is a very complicated procedure. Setting the angle, centering the bubble, here from the point of view. Centering the bubble is a little fiddly with the dividing head's 1 to 40 gearing ratio. Ah, missed it. Yeah, this should be good. And now we move the crosshair into the fixed reference target and then read the angle. The farther away the target, the smaller are testing errors from eccentricity between dividing head axis of rotation and theodolite axis. So I was using that mountain farm again as a target, which is roughly 2.5 kilometers away. This time I had to use a window corner. The target is not out of focus actually, rather the shop window is continually fogging. Also later I ran out of daylight, so I repeated the test with another target on the shop's other end. This sticker here has a nice half cross to aim at. And reading the angle with the optical micrometer. If you're interested how this is done, I show this in my dividing head testing video. And noting the value in calligraphic writing, of course. So, how about the results? Let's check the one degree increment mechanism first. The gray dots in this diagram are the results from the mountain farm target, while the green ones are the ones from the sticker target. The slight differences between them are probably mostly caused by the type of reading. The gray ones I read only the single way, while the green ones I read standard and inverted. This is also explained in my dividing head testing video in case you're interested. So this axis shows the level's error, and this one shows the mechanism setting from 0 to 45 degrees. So, all in all, our errors are well below two arc minutes, actually below one and three quarter minutes. 
I was expecting to see evidence of some gang tooling from teeth shaping in these results. However, I cannot pinpoint this in here. Probably the multi-tooth spring-loaded latch masks this. Anyway, I'm very happy with these results and we see that this mechanical clinometer is at least factor 4, more realistically factor 8 more precise than typical cheap digital levels. And finally, the results for the slider mechanism. You see that I tested this one with 10 arc minute increments and our maximum error is roughly 1.5 minutes. The error's behavior in this diagram is continuous as to be expected from a short smoothly curved bar. Still, 1.5 minutes accuracy is surely impressive for such a simple mechanism. Alright guys, this wraps it up. As always, thanks for your interest in this video. I appreciate your time. All the best and thank you!